so I was passionate about teaching and I really wanted to further my education and so I began to talk to Kevin about what that might look like and if I uh, pursued a master's degree in education I began to ponder the different options and so when I talked to Kevin he threw out one that I had never even considered and that was maybe not to go in the area of education but to think about maybe seminary and I remember when he suggested it I didn't even receive the suggestion because of my previous experience thinking that I would never want to go through taking theology classes again as soon as I laid in my bed I began to wrestle and I realized as I was reflecting on the thoughts that were going on in my head that the Lord was speaking to me and he was challenging me to think about what Kevin had challenged me to um, to consider going to seminary and I heard myself say things like Lord that can't happen because I'm the income Kevin's at seminary and I'm I'm the money but in my heart I heard God say this very clearly do you want to be in my will and I answered yes Lord I want to be in your will it was clear then go to seminary I had no idea how we would pay the bills I didn't have any answers really to my questions except for when the Lord said do you want to be in my will and the answer to that question is yes Lord that question is yes Lord and do you want to be in my will if you would have asked Sherry when she was in junior high what do you want to be when you grow up what do you want to do she'd say school teacher if you'd asked her in high school or college while she was doing a degree in education, what do you want to do? I want to be a school teacher. She knew what grade she wanted to teach. She knew her heart was there. If you'd asked Sherry when she was at seminary doing a master's in theology, what do you want to be doing? She probably would have said, being a school teacher. <laughs> uh, that's, I think that's where her heart and mind were at. But she also knew that God was saying to her, do you want to be in my will? Sherry didn't know when she went to seminary why. She didn't know that one day she'd be teaching and training leaders and speaking and writing stuff. She didn't know any of that stuff. She just knew that God said, this is the mission I have for you. This is where I'm sending you. And God just sort of directed, nudged, kind of, kind of spoke and gave her that call, gave her that mission. If you want to experience the empowering presence of God, discover what it's like to listen, to hear God's call, to feel his gentle, heavenly, you know, okay, over there. <laughs> and to follow where he calls you to go. There's an empowering presence of God that we experience when we're on his mission, when we follow his call. We're in this four-week series. We're actually finishing up a four-week series. I, I told you three weeks ago, we we're going to kind of put our, our tent pegs down deep in the turf of this topic of being empowered, and we're just going to stay there for four weeks, and we're wrapping that up. But we've been talking every week about the reality that in our world, in our culture, in our way of thinking, a lot of people, they want to be powerful. I can do it all by myself. I can handle it. I can take care of it. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. I can handle this. And there's sort of that appeal in being able to do it all by yourself. I am powerful. The problem is, that's not a biblical way to live. If you're a Christian, that's not God's design. The problem is, we're not powerful enough to be able to do everything on our own. We run out. We get exhausted. We get tired. We get emotionally spent, and we can't keep pushing. But some people want to be in this place where I'm powerful. Other people in our culture, and it's happening, I think, a lot more, more and more people are saying, well, I'm powerless. It's the other end of the continuum. I'm a victim. I can't do anything. Everyone has to take care of me. I just, I can't do anything. I'm so weak. I'm, I'm nothing. And that's not biblical either. If you're a Christian, you're not called to be powerless. You're not called to be powerful. What we're called to be, if we're followers of Jesus, is to be empowered by the presence of God. That God lives in us and works through us. And the beauty of living an empowered life is simply this. You don't run out of what you need because God has an endless reservoir of power. You don't, and I don't, but God does. And when you walk an empowered life, walking in the presence of Jesus, filled by His Spirit, He gives you the strength when you don't have it. So like the Apostle Paul, you can say, for when I am weak, Paul says, then I am strong. How does that work? Because God comes and empowers you in your times of weakness. 
Three weeks ago, we were talking about this idea of being empowered, and we said that one source of being empowered is a strange one. It's one that we don't even like to think about sometimes. But sometimes God empowers us through suffering, loss, and pain. If you talk to most Christians and say, listen, when was the time you really experienced that God was with you and God carried you and God was powerful and personal? You know what people will say? Man, when I was going through a tough time, a time of loss and pain and heartache and struggle, and God just showed up and filled me and carried me through. And you experienced God's power when you were weak. Sometimes God shows up in those times in great and powerful ways, and we don't look for those times, but when they come, God shows himself powerful. Two weeks ago, we talked about how we're empowered by community. That when we become a follower of Jesus, and if you're not yet a Christian and you become a Christian, you actually become part of a family. You know, our eight gatherings on this campus and our other gatherings around the world, we're all part of one body, one church, not just Shoreline, but Jesus' church. It's bigger than us. And, and God says, I'm going to empower you through the people around you. And when you walk in community with people, God pours his power through them. We looked at that at the Bible story of the paralytic, the man who couldn't walk, who wanted to meet Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to ask Jesus to heal him, and he couldn't get there. So what do his friends do? They pick up his mat, and they carry him. And they bring him to Jesus, and Jesus heals him, and his life has changed. And we said that sometimes we're on the mat. Sometimes we're struggling, hurting, and others can empower us and lift us up as God pours through them. And, and sometimes we're doing well, so we can help pick up somebody else's mat. And God empowers them through us. Community. God empowers us through community. And we talked about how if you're really living the way God wants you to live, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to live your life like this. Holding on to the hand of somebody who's more mature, further down the road with Jesus, and they help you along, and they help you grow, but you're also helping somebody else who's kind of climbing the mountain of faith, and you're helping them along. And we live our lives like this. And in that community, we're empowered. And then last week, Pastor Nate talked about how we're empowered by Sabbath and rest, that God did not make you to work seven days a week. Your boss may think God made you for that, but your boss is wrong. God has made us with a rhythm in our soul and in our bodies that in every seven days in that rhythm, there should be a day of rest, a day of refreshment to meet with God, to meet with people, to, to play, to be refreshed, to be filled. And here's the spiritual reality. You will get more done in six days of labor and one day of rest than you will in seven days of labor. You will. Because mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you get recharged in that Sabbath day. So we talked about that need to find that place of rest and let God empower us that way. And today, we're talking about kind of another category of being empowered, that God empowers us through mission, through a call, through directing our lives. Now, many of you have been on a mission trip. Many of you have gone on a mission trip and you've experienced going to El Salvador or Mexico or Honduras. We have people right now in the Philippines. We've got people going next week to, uh, to uh, Nepal. We have people going all over the world doing ministry and mission and following God's call to be there. And have you ever, if you've ever been on a mission trip, whether you're, it's a youth group trip or whatever, if you've been on a mission trip, you know that something happens when you go on a mission trip. You get empowered. You just, when you're on a mission trip, let's be honest, you just love people better. I mean, you're, you're in mission trip mode. You know, you're, you're praying in advance. You, you, go, you get on a plane, you get on a bus, and you go to this place. And when you get there, you're just kind of filled with love, and you serve more passionately, and you sacrifice more freely because you are on a mission trip. I mean, you, you're just in that. You know, if you've been on a trip, you know what I'm talking about? You just, sometimes when you're on a mission trip, you think to yourself, I wish I could be like this when I get home because I'm just loving and caring and just talking about Jesus. And I just, man, it's amazing. And, and, and you think, man, I wish that this could be my life all the time. Well, you know what? It can be, and it should be. What if you were on a mission trip every day? What if you went on a mission trip every time you went to go work out at the health club, every time you went to school, every time you walked around to your community, every time you went shopping? What if you didn't have to get on a plane to go on a mission trip? What if all you had to do was wake up and say, Lord, send me, use me? Could God show up and empower you in a new way if you were on mission and following the call of God every day of your life? And I believe he not only can, he wants to. And I often wonder what would happen in the Monterey County area, through the Salinas Valley, through Monterey, what would happen if all of if the thousands of people who are part of Shoreline, the thousands of people who, who this weekend and Monday night will be part of what happens here and part of showing the other parts of the world. What if every one of us got up tomorrow morning and Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning and we knew we were on a mission trip? 
and we were ready to follow Jesus and to love and serve and care in the name of Jesus. That would change our community and it would change our lives because that excitement and that energy and that passion that you get on a mission trip, that should be our lives every day. But usually most days we're just kind of like, it's just another day and, and you know, kind of the kind of American culture ways. Well, it's just a day. It's a day for me and it's a day that what, what do I want to do? And, what, and we kind of do our thing and I work when I have to and I just kind of do my thing and we're not looking and noticing and loving and serving. But if we were to do that, I think we'd be empowered in fresh and new and beautiful ways. So I want to actually pause for a minute and I want to pray. And if you're a guest here visiting, when a pastor prays, you think that they're done, but I'm not done, okay? So don't, don't start packing up. Um, I got time on the clock and I'm still preaching somewhere. I'm just praying that God would speak to us and kind of move in our hearts. So let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you for this chance to gather together. Many people who know and love you, <clears throat> who've been walking with you for a lot of years, or they're brand new in their faith. And we want to serve you and live for you and be on your mission, be led and guided and direct to go where you call us to go and love who you want us to love in the name of Jesus. And Lord, there's many people here today who've never really understood who you are and, and they don't even know that, God, you love them and you died for them. They don't even know that <clears throat> you have a great plan for their life. I pray you speak to them today and they can see there's so much more to this life. And if we walk with you, we can experience your power and the joy of impacting lives in a beautiful way every day of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, each week we've looked at different characters in the Bible and kind of learned from their experiences and how they were empowered by the presence of God in their own way. And today we're going to look at a man named Isaiah. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, uh, there's a simple lesson we learned from Isaiah. There's many lessons, but the one I want to focus on is just two words. Here's the lesson. Send me. Send me. That's our lesson from Isaiah. That he had this heart that said to God, God, send me. I want to go out for you. I want to share for you. I want to love for you. I want to serve for you. God, send me. Let me be your person in this world. And in chapter 6 of Isaiah, Isaiah is having this vision. He has this vision of God, and he sees heaven, and he sees God's glory and smoke and noise. It's just this, it's a, you know, read the whole thing at some point. It's this powerful vision of God. But in this vision, he becomes transformed. He has a new mission, a new call in his life. And I think this is something God wants to do in each of our lives as well. So Isaiah sees the glory of God, he sees the power of God, he sees the holiness of God, and here's his response in verse 5. Isaiah says, woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. Another version says, I'm undone. Another version says, I'm falling apart. He says, he says woe to me, I cried, for I'm ruined, I'm coming apart, I'm coming unhinged. He says, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah has this vision of God. And he sees God's holiness and God's glory. And he says, I am falling apart. Because I've seen the Lord of glory. And I realize in the light of his holiness, in the light of his glory, Isaiah is saying this, I see who I am. I'm foul mouth. I'm a sinful person. As a matter of fact, not only am I sinful, not only am I a man of unclean lips, but everyone around me is too. In the light of God's glory, you get a perspective on who you really are, and Isaiah does. And then something happens, verse 6. Then one of the seraphim, this heavenly being, flew to me with a live coal in his hand. You can see that glowing orange coal, this live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth. You can hear it, this is on his lips. You can smell the flesh. With it, he touched my mouth and he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. God says, Isaiah, you've recognized your sin. You've recognized that you're a man of unclean lips. Let's do something about it. And he cleanses him. He heals him and he washes him clean. That's what God does today through Jesus. When we understand, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a woman of unclean lips. I'm in a people. Of, I'm in a sinful world. I'm a sinful person. I need someone to cleanse me. God says, I got the answer for you. His name is Jesus. And when you come to the cross and you accept his death on the cross and the payment for your sins and his resurrection, it's like, it's like he heals you. He sears you and cleanses you and makes you new. He transforms your life through that touch of Jesus Christ. And you're never the same. And here's Isaiah. He's been touched by God. He's been cleansed. And so verse 8, God speaks. 
It says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? This triune God, this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit says to Isaiah, he says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? He asks him the same question he asks every one of us every day if we've come to Jesus, if we've been seared and cleansed by the presence of Jesus Christ. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah has a chance to respond. Not me, God, I'm kind of busy. No, no, not in the presence of this God. But God sears him and God heals him and God cleanses him. And God says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah tells us, and I said, listen to these words, here am I, send me. Oh God, send me. This man who a moment before was profoundly aware of the holiness of God and his own sin, had now been cleansed. And when God says, who am I going to send out into this world? Who is going to bring my message? Who is going to bring my love? Who can I send? Who will speak for me? Even if it's with blistered, battered lips, who will speak for me? And Isaiah says, Lord, I will. I will. And I believe that God asks that question every day of every one of us who've come to the presence of Jesus and been seared and with that cathartic touch and that cleansing touch of Jesus. We've been born again, given new life, and God says, now who will go for me? Who can I send? And we get a chance to say, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. Every day of our lives, we have this amazing opportunity. I believe if we take advantage of that opportunity, we will be on a mission trip every day of our lives. We'll hear the call of God and be on the mission of God and we will be empowered by the presence of God every moment of every day. And days will no longer be boring, slow, nothing to do, same thing over and over. Our days will come alive because we'll be on the mission that God's given to us. How do you see an ordinary day as an extraordinary call to mission? I think think you, you say to God, I'm willing for you to send me. You make yourself available. If you're a note taker and your outline is a place to write some notes here, but there's three ways I think we can ask God to send us. Here's when God says, who shall I send? Who will go for us? How do you respond? How about this? Send me to notice the people around me. Help me feel something. God, will you send me to my school campus, to my workplace, into my own home with my family, to my neighbors, where I work out, where I, where I socialize. God, will you send me? But God, help me feel something. Send me to notice the needs around me. You know what? There's needs in Nepal. And we got a couple of our pastors, Pastor Dennis and Roy, they're going to be there doing ministry soon. There's needs in the Philippines. We've got people over there right now. There's needs in El Salvador and Honduras and Mexico. We go to these places. But you know what? There are needs on your school campus. There are needs where you work. There are needs in your neighborhood. God, help me notice those needs and help me feel because God feels and God cares and he wants us to care with him. You want to be empowered. You want to have a great day every day. You start your day by saying, oh God, help send me to notice the needs around me and let me feel for people and then send me to serve those who are in need with compassion in the name of Jesus. Do something. Don't just notice and feel, but but actually take action, serve, and do something. Lord, will you send me to notice and feel, but then when I notice and feel, and here's the thing, you can't meet every need all the time of every person. You can't. But you can notice what God puts on your heart, and you can serve and do something in the name of Jesus. And there's a lot of people around you. You don't, have to, you don't have to go to El Salvador for this. You don't have to go to, to, to we, we partner with the orphanage in Mexico. That's great ministry. But you might get down there once a year, every couple of years. But there's needs all around you. Help me notice, then help me do something. Help me serve. And then send me to speak with words of hope and life, the words of Jesus. God, let me notice and feel. Let me serve and do something. But but God, will you help me say something? Because here's the reality. People need to know that there is a God in heaven who loves them, who's powerful, who's glorious, 
who came to this world, God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ on Christmas, who died on the cross, who rose again in glory, and who loves them beyond their wildest imagination. People have to know there's a God who loves them. And you know what? They're not going to get that through the media. The media's going to say, all these Christians are hate-mongering, horrible people. It's just not true. But you know what? Media sells and people buy it. But you go out and you speak and you let people know that you know a God who loves you, who's forgiven you, even though you didn't deserve it, who's patient with you. Oh, man, is God patient with us. And you let people know what he's doing. You speak and you give words to this good news of Jesus. You share his simple story. And people say, well, but, but you know, but, but wait a minute, you know, isn't, isn't God also just and holy? Absolutely. He's holy, holy, holy. That's what got Isaiah on his knees. That's what got Isaiah to say, I'm a man of unclean lips. We know that. So God is pure and holy and glorious, but he's tender and patient and loving. And if you know him, you share him. Can you imagine what your day would be like tomorrow, Monday? You wake up in the morning, you say, oh God, send me to notice the needs around me and to feel. Not everybody, all needs, just what you want me to notice and let me feel. God, send me to serve and do something in your name and send me to speak and to share that simple story of Jesus when it's appropriate, when it's organic, when it feels right. And God will make every day of the rest of your life a mission trip. Then when you go on a mission trip to to, to Honduras, or you go on a mission trip to Nepal, it's just, I'm doing what I do every day, I'm just doing it over there. Because this is our lives. And then you don't wake up in the morning and say, it's going to be a boring, there's nothing going on today. You say, God, what's going to be going on today? This is going to be exciting. This is going to be amazing. Will you dare to declare the words, here am I, send me. Now here stood Isaiah, and he saw the glory of God, and he saw the holiness of God, and he was undone, and God seared him, and God healed him, and God washed him clean. And now God says, who shall I send? Who will go? And he says, here am I, send me. Will you say to God, God, here am I, send me. If you're a follower of Jesus, he's asking you, Day by day, will you follow me? Will you serve for me? Will you live for me? Will you make every day of your life a mission trip? And you would join countless others who've heard God all through the Bible. There's just person after person after person who God nudges, calls, directs, and they get to decide, are they going to follow? So Abraham, I call his story going without knowing. God says to Abraham, this is, this is back in the Old Testament, ancient times. God says, Abraham, follow me. Just start going, I'll lead you. And when you get to where I'm taking you, I'll let you know. You know what he did? He packed up his whole family and he started going because God called him. You talk about a mission trip. You talk about using by, being used by God. Abraham was used by God in amazing ways. Esther, this young woman in a foreign land, a prisoner of war. She's called to go and confront the king about what's going to happen to her people. They're going to be slaughtered. And she knows if she goes to the king uninvited, the law of the land was if you walk to the king uninvited, you'd be executed unless he held up his scepter and invited you in. Automatic execution. But she's called by God to go and confront the king and raise an appeal for her people. And she says, I'll go to the king, and if I die, I die. Will you follow God no matter what the cost, if you know he's leading you? Amos was a shepherd, just a shepherd. And God said, preach. And the whole story, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is right in the Bible. When you follow God, second grade teachers become theologians and teachers. When you follow God, punk kids who plan on dealing 21 in Tahoe as their job become pastors. Right? When, you fo- when you follow Jesus, you, you, it's exciting. Every day becomes an adventure. Mary, Mary, one day has an angel say, you're going to be with child, even though you've never been with a man. And she says, may it be to me as you have said. May the Lord's will be done. Will you hear the invitation of God today as he calls you to follow to go on mission every day. I hope all of you take a shoreline mission trip or a trip with some other church somewhere out there. But I hope more than that, that every day you're on a mission trip. Each week we've been, in this series, we've been listening to kind of the heartbeat, to the voices of different people. And I want you to listen. If, if Isaiah could come right now, I mean, if Isaiah could show up here after what he experienced, 
and he could challenge us. What would be on his heart? What might Isaiah say to us? Just quiet your heart and listen to these words. Worshiper of the king, keep your eyes on heaven and see the king of glory lifted up. Don't let your heart and eyes fixate on thrones, oval offices, or seats of power on this earth. Human leaders come and go, but the king of all kings rules and reigns eternally. Come near to the true ruler of the universe. Though your knees buckle under the sheer glory of his holiness, though all heaven quakes under the force of his presence, draw near. Confess your sins. Let the cold touch your lips. Be cleansed by the grace of God. Look into the face of the crucified and risen Lord and know that his grace is yours by faith. You will be undone. In his presence, you will be changed, broken, emptied, and filled. You will see Jesus, and you will never be the same. Then when the God of heaven calls you to go, serve, love, to give, sacrifice, and follow, you will boldly declare, Hear my Lord, send me. Hear my Lord, send me. You know, if you become a follower of Jesus, if you give your heart to him, if you come to the cross, you receive his forgiveness, you're cleansed of your sin, then you become a Christian. And we use that term Christian. You know what a Christian is? It's somebody who's looking more and more like Jesus. Someone who's becoming more and more like Jesus. So, so think about Jesus for a moment. I mean, think about how he lived his life. His mission the mission of Jesus was to seek and to save the lost. Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. When, when Jesus was asked, Why are you here on this planet? The term he used for himself was the Son of Man. He said, The Son of Man came to seek and to sa save the lost. He's the good shepherd looking for lost sheep. He found me when I was 16. He found Sherry when she was five. He found a lot of you at different times in your life, younger and older but he came to seek and save the lost. If we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to be Christians, we need to seek and save the lost. We continue his work in the world because that was the heart of Jesus. The call he gave on the life of every Christian is to shine his light. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 talks about the fact that we're the light of the world. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Jesus is speaking. He says, you, my followers, you're the light of the world. He says, a city that's up on a hill, you can't hide it. He says, nobody lights a lamp and puts a bowl over it. I mean, nobody lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. But they put it on a stand where everyone can see it. And that's the heart of Jesus. He says, understand. He said, I came to seek and save the lost. That's your mission too. Jesus said, but you, you're the light. Your light shines in this world. You say, well, you know, I don't want to be the light. I don't want to do that. Well, if you're a Christian, guess what? You're the light. <laughs> you may be under a bushel. You may be on a stand, but you're still the light. You say, well, that's not my gifting. That's not my passion, being light. It's not an option. <laughs> if you become a Christian, the light of Jesus just resides in you by his Holy Spirit. So everywhere you go, the light shines. Everywhere you go, the presence of Jesus is going with you. So just go for it, man. Make it, just, I'm on mission every morning when I wake up. Lord, how, how, you know, let me feel, let me notice and feel, let me serve and do something, and let me share and say something about Jesus. And then Jesus gives his call to those who don't yet know his love, a call to come home. In Matthew eleven twenty five 25 to 30, Jesus talks about those who are far from him. I love this in verse 28 of Matthew 11. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke or, or my way of life upon you and learn from me. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. You know what Jesus doesn't say? He doesn't say to somebody who's not a Christian, come to me, all of you who have your life all together and you've straightened yourself out. Because you know what? Nobody would come. And some people are waiting to get it all together before they come to Jesus. It doesn't work that way. He says, come if you're weary. Come if you're burdened. And you go, oh, I can do, I can do weary and burdened. I can do that. You know, he says, come to me, and I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you a way to live the rest of your life that's going to have meaning and purpose and joy. Jesus is our perfect example of how to live our lives. He lived on mission. He left the glory of heaven to come here for you and for me. And when he left this world, he said, now I'm putting it in your hands. Now it's you, you do what I've been doing, and you keep living out this mission. 
So in Acts chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1. I love this passage. What's happened is Jesus has died on the cross for our sins. He's been buried for three days. He's risen again in glory, and it's after his resurrection and before he goes back to heaven. So what does Jesus do after he rises from the dead before he goes back to heaven? He teaches. He meets with people. He, he prepares them for when he's leaving so that they can keep the mission going. And so Jesus says this. We, we read this in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. It says, They gathered around him, around Jesus, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They asked a political question. Can we be in charge again? Jesus says, that's not what it's all about. Verse 7, Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father sets by his own authority, but you will receive power. Here's the empowering presence of God. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right where you live, in all Judea, the surrounding community, Samaria, the tough places, the other side of the tracks, the places you might avoid, and the ends of the earth. He says, you're going to be my witnesses. This is God's call. This is God's dream. This is God's plan. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you got to hear this. Every day is a mission trip if you follow Jesus. And if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, when you come to the place where you come to the cross and confess your sin and he cleanses and heals you and gives you new life, this will be your call for the rest of your life to bring that news of Jesus, to bring his love, to bring his heart, to bring his concern. So here's the words I want you to think about. Here am I, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. Send me back into my home. When I, when, I, when I was 16 and became a Christian, you know the first place God sent me? Munchie's Pizza. I worked there. And a guy named Mark Hoffnagels, who'd never heard about Jesus, through a, a, a 16-year-old who knew I, knew, I didn't grow up in the church, I knew nothing about the Bible at that point. I, just, I got my first Bible right about that time. But I told him about who Jesus was the best I could. And he came to the cross and he received Jesus. And God said, now go in your own home. That's your mission field, and share with your siblings. Now go to Fountain Valley High School and share with the other kids. And each step of my life, God just tells me where to go. And it's usually not somewhere far away and exotic. It's usually somewhere very ordinary with profound needs and people that need Jesus. So I want you to think about these words. Here am I, send me. And I'm going to do something I've never done before except for the last service. I've never done this here at Shoreline or any other church. But I really feel, as I prayed and prepared, I feel like today there are some of you, and this is not all of you, but there's some of you, as you've been listening to this message, here's what God's been doing in your heart. You have this sense that God is saying to you today, you got to engage, that I'm sending you every day to your campus, to your workplace, to your neighborhood, to your family, to your social settings, and that God is just saying to you, you got to notice, and you got to love, and you got to serve, and you got to be a little more bold. And you just feel like God is saying to you, it's time that you let God send you. And some of you may have had those moments where it's been strong and profound, but for some of you today, right now today, you know that God is saying to you, I need to be ready to be sent with the love of Jesus out into my ordinary day. Yes, I may go on mission trips way out there, but I mean, I just know that right now God is saying, it's time for me to say, here am I, send me. Here's what I want to ask you to do. If God's doing that in your heart right now, if that's been happening through the service and you just know God wants you to have that moment where you say, God, here am I, send me. I'm going to ask you to do something in just a moment to stand where you are and either quietly say, here am I, send me, or loud say, here am I, send me. And if you, people say at the same time, that's fine. But I'm going to ask you if, you, if you feel like the Holy Spirit is saying to you today, this is for you. Then I'm going to ask you to stand and to declare, here am I, send me, before God, and then remain standing so I can pray for you. Say it out loud. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we all have moments in our lives that are decisive moments. There's many people here sitting right now who they've had that moment. They've felt your call, and they're seeking to live out this daily mission, but there's others that today is a special day because they believe with all their heart that you are saying, who will I send and who will go for me? 
And God, they have stood before you and before their family in this church, and they have said, here am I, Lord, send me. And so, Lord, we pray you would empower them, strengthen them, make every day a mission trip for them, and let your light shine through them in new and powerful ways. And I'm going to ask all those who, can, who are able to stand to stand with us as we close in prayer. So everyone else who's able to stand, just stand with us as we pray together. And Lord Jesus, we stand in your presence. Some stand here today, and they still don't yet know who you are. But their hearts are open. They're trying to figure this Jesus thing out. Would you keep drawing them close and moving them nearer and nearer and nearer to you? Open their hearts, Lord. Let them know your arms are wide open to them. And Lord, for all of us who have put our faith in you, who've had that moment where we just knew you were calling us to live more profoundly for you, may this be a rekindling of that vision. Lord, we pray that you would send us every day, that we would not make a mission trip something that happens once every three or four years or once in a lifetime, but that you would empower us with your presence that every day of our lives, oh God, we would walk into our day, into our school, into our workplace, into our home, into our neighborhoods, into our social settings with a profound sense that this is the mission field and we carry your good news and your love and your grace. Use us, Lord. Here we are, Lord. Send us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.